Well, hello everybody. This is Robert Mikan, Medical Director with Cactus Life Sciences. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. I wanted to thank Informa and Rebecca and Shelly, our moderator and Rick behind the scenes today. So today we'll be discussing the anatomy of clinical judgment for the process of clinical evaluation, essentially reproducing the thought processes employed by physicians so that we can analyze or make more apparent medical reasoning in the context of clinical evaluation. As you can see, we have a rather ambitious agenda set forth today. That uh, erratic scribble that you see represents clinical judgment. It's really emblematic of the methodological labyrinth that stands in between the data and the decisions that we have to make. Lest we get too comfortable with that agenda, this is where we're headed together today. But before we dive in too deep, I would like for you to imagine that you are the patient. Some event has occurred, pain, trauma, fatigue, loss of appetite, a lump, some sign or symptom that has compromised the perception of your own health. So you've assumed the role of a patient and in doing so, a series of questions becomes critical. What is wrong? Is it serious? What will it mean to me? Can it be cured? By what means is the cure worthwhile? At what cost? What should I do? And these and corollary questions can be distilled down into about three general generic questions. What can be wrong? What can be done? And what should be done? And it's these questions that must be answered if clinical judgment is to be a complete and authentic judgment. Now, imagine that you are the clinical evaluator. So those previous questions still pertinent uh, as inputs into the state of the art, perhaps. However, they're augmented by a new series of critical questions. What is the product, the risk class? What data exist? Can it be approved by what means? Is the remediation worthwhile? At what cost? Is there a value proposition? What should we do? And these and corollary questions can be reduced into three generic categories. Data sufficiency, conformity assessment, alignment, alignment of our clinical data with information materials, with risk management, with state of the art. Are there gaps? If so, are they significant? If so, what can and should be done? And it's these questions that require answers if the clinical evaluative judgment is to be a complete and authentic judgment. So what is clinical judgment? A uh, rather ambiguous term uh, at face value, but traditionally it's the capacity to process data across decision points to arrive at conclusions. So it's the way that we reach conclusions. It sounds benign enough. Uh, it's, it's an intellectual exercise that, that deploys an information processing system and it is end oriented. So it's focused at a decision or an action or conclusions. And the judgment is clinical because it's, it's rendered at the level of the individual patient. It's applied at every stage of clinical medicine from observation. So that initial note taking, right? What, what data can we afford to ignore? What data are critical to diagnosis? to therapy, to intervene, not to intervene. If we do intervene, how and when, and when do we alter the treatment regimen and so forth. And finally, but always first in the mind of the patient is prognosis. So what's the likely outcome? Should I modify my plans for the day, for the week, for the year, et cetera? And this iterative loop of judgment, observation, judgment, decision, is carried throughout the course of the medical encounter until we reach some sort of corrective, remedial and or preventive health action. Now, on the side of clinical evaluation, do we not wish for our evaluators to possess some capacity to process data across decision points at every stage of clinical evaluation to arrive at conclusions? And I do appreciate this slide within a slide here. It's courtesy of David Rutledge. It, it identifies some of the pricklier areas of our work, perhaps with 
more hues of ambiguity. And at this time, I would implore the listeners, if you feel so inclined to submit in the chat box, maybe some of the areas of your workflow with regard to clinical evaluation that you think require relatively more judgment. I think that would be interesting to take a look at. Now, we, we said that we can begin to understand clinical judgment in the larger context of this information processing system. So note that the entire system is predicated on data, right? As scientists, we know that, that we can draw inferences from data, but we cannot draw scientific inference without data. So data is key. And if you see at the top here, the data is derived from the patient. It's processed by a physician who renders a judgmental decision and there's the relationship to action and outcome there, hopefully a positive change or maintenance in the disease course. So that data, those data elements are brought forward reactively. They come in from the patient or they're proactively sought after through exams and histories and labs and imaging. How much? Enough to sufficiently clarify the issue so that we can administer therapy and or generate additional data. And this should start to ring a little bit of a bell here because on the clinical evaluation side, we're also receiving data, but now it's from the device. It's at the level of patient population. So now we're at clinical science, which is a little antithetical to the level of, of the patient in clinical medicine, but evaluators receive and filter that data. They render judgmental decisions and, and the relationship to outcome that you see here, which hopefully is a change, a positive change or a maintenance in the regulatory course. And as we know, we are proactively and reactively seeking those data so that we can sufficiently clarify the issues that they can then be analyzed and documented in a report or a determination to generate additional data. But why do we need clinical judgment? Essentially, because the data are problematic. They are indeterminate. They cannot speak for themselves. They, re they require context. They're uncertain. Sir William Osler, one of the founders of Johns Hopkins Hospital called clinical medicine, the science of uncertainty. We're dealing with multiple variables at one time. It requires a multivariate mindset. In fact, I, I feel like our, our minds are like information highways with all the, the, the data that we're processing. They're complex in magnitude and sometimes in paucity, in precision. Have you seen the confidence intervals? They can be quite wide if they're presented at all. They're subject to cognitive errors, uh, be it anchoring, confirmation bias. So are we, are we seeking out data that fits some preconceived notion of a safe device performing as intended? They're incomplete, which is different from insufficient. They're of questionable clinical significance, which is different from statistical significance. Hypothesis testing and p-values, regardless of how small the p-value is not sufficient for clinical medicine and arguably clinical evaluation, it needs to be medically and clinically significant. And the data are interpreted on a spectrum. If you're like me, you feel like we're required oftentimes to take absolutist points of view and lines of demarcation uh, with things like, where's the device safe versus not safe? Benefit risk, acceptable versus not acceptable. It's like drawing straight solid lines and shifting sand sometimes. So we recognize that we have our data fraught with limitations, data only a parent could love, uh, but it must be converted into a decision nevertheless. And in doing so, we subject it to various stages of sub-processing, which constitute clinical judgment. So the data are filtered through general principles, so pathophysiology, perhaps regulatory science, clinical science, statistical science. That is enjoined with our experience, which we cannot discount. If you recall MedDev 2.71, revision four, we had that experience requirement uh, for evaluators. It, it was not an insignificant addition. It was impactful. And then with reasoning, which is a focus of this discussion, it's really a chain of inductive and deductive reasoning that is serially 
continuously modified by these data that are replete with limitations. So the data is then appraised and weighted, which we would expect when we have multiple variables. We're used to that. That's a stage of clinical evaluation, as is analysis. And if we can perform that analysis in an economy of steps, we might even pass the scientific test of elegance, which a reviewer or an auditor would appreciate so long as we're being complete and comprehensive. Not too algorithmic. We love algorithms, but we feel that shouldn't be divorced from analysis. And we want to avoid what I would call intellectual appeasement through incomprehension. So are we overly verbose and in, in science sounding, but, but really a little too flowery, maybe uh, evasive, not really getting directly to the point. So we want to be clear, concise, complete, comprehensive, comprehensible. But this entire process is shot through with uncertainty and why wouldn't it be? Medicine is the science of uncertainty. I think clinical evaluation is also the science of uncertainty, but we can mitigate uncertainty. We can deploy these intellectual risk controls, these logical instruments, things like scientific reasoning, statistical logic, dialectic, ethical and rhetorical modes of reasoning. I wanted to just highlight dialectic. It may be a less familiar term, but if you could imagine you're having a discussion with one of your colleagues and you, you hold oppo opposing points of view, but you're genuinely trying to establish the truth through reasoned methods of argumentation. This is not emotive language, emotional appeals, persuasive rhetoric. It's truly vetting your understanding, iron sharpening iron. And this can be done with a colleague, with a cross-functional team, even internally in our own minds, if we just start to learn to think counterfactually, to slice different vectors through our understanding, because judgment really is about slowing down our thinking, being more intentional about our thinking, about the ways we are thinking. It's what differentiates judgment from judging, which is more of that instinctual, quick, reactionary type of decision-making, not always grounded, in, in critical analysis. So we can revisit uh, our rudimentary definition. We've had a chance to unpack this and we might see that clinical judgment is more precisely defined as the capacity to filter, cluster, appraise, weight, assess, analyze data, which are indeterminate, complex, incomplete, uncertain, imprecise, of questionable significance, multivariate, subject to cognitive errors, interpreted on a spectrum across a multi-step end oriented concatenation of decision points, which are shot through with uncertainty that must be optimized via logical instruments to arrive at prudent and judicious conclusions rather than a statement of scientific law. And we wonder why our work feels challenging at the end of the day. And I do think it's healthy to note that that last fragment there that we are not after statements of scientific law. We can relieve ourselves from that burden. This is reinforced by Richard Harris in the book Rigor Mortis. So about a million biomedical studies published a year, many are simply wrong. Scientists are unconsciously willing data to tell a story that's not in fact true. We need to be very careful of those discussion sections in the literature. Uh, gradually, scientists do a better job approximating truth over time, but parallel narratives, sometimes sharply at odds with one another, are at play. So what can we do? I, I, let, focusing on that, that last piece of the excerpt, I think is, is very germane. Scientists, clinical evaluators, physicians, auditors, rely on their own individual judgments to decide which stories come closer to the truth. Again, absolute truth is forever, forever out of reach. So where's judgment deployed? We talked about these three generic questions. We only have time to give the first one a, a semi-vigorous theoretical workup. That's the, the diagnostic classificatory question here. What can be done? This framework breaks down essentially into patterns, probability, and certainty. You may already be informally using this approach in, in your workflow. But of the data patterns, which conclusions or diagnoses have the highest probability and to what degree of certainty. 
Regarding data patterns, it's important to understand that no single clue, no single piece of clinical data is sufficient. We're seeking multiple data endpoints. Beyond that, we're seeking multiple relevant data endpoints. There's a lot of noise out there against the signal and we're, we're clustering that meaningful data. If you think about deriving S&P measures, clinical outcome parameters, acceptance criteria, you get the idea. A simplistic example here, a patient presents with a sore throat. That single symptom would not automatically warrant administration of antibiotics. We're gonna seek additional data elements. We're gonna ask questions, duration of illness, get a temperature, is there a fever? We'll look inside the throat. Is it consistent with strep pharyngitis? We'll probably even get a confirmatory test, a culture, perhaps. Whatever it takes to reach decision warranting probability. Not necessarily a black and white statistical number, it's a degree of belief, a decision warranting probability to justify our action. But we also have to confront certitude with each of the decisions that we make. Uh, there's a level of certainty that we have. And when those conditions, as you see on the screen, are ideal, it allows us to operate under 100% cert certitude, certainty, which we would call a diagnostic closure in this setting, but it would be closure around the conclusions that we're making. However, reality has its way of frustrating ideal conditions and oftentimes a number, several, most, all, or some degree of these conditions are not ideal. And when that happens, the certainty starts to erode. It starts to move left on that spectrum away from 100% into the realm of working conclusions or working diagnoses. The further left we go, we get in the, the realm of opinions. I don't think we're ever operating under 100% certitude. So the second we start inching away from that number, we're introducing an error rate and we open ourselves up to questioning. Questions from cross-functional review teams, questions perhaps three rounds of questions from bodies that are notified. And this recurring theme of uncertainty allows us to revisit this idea of logical instruments. And this slide is essentially to show that it's not just about arbitrary implementation of these modes of reasoning. Each question is unique in its nature and its complexity. And each question requires a unique mix of logical instruments. So it's not static, it's case-based, it's risk-based. And as an example, we can look at that first question, what can be wrong? And we see the scientific paradigm is most at play there, probably because we have uh, scientific tests or whatnot that aren't 100% certain, there's false positives. But as we move into the therapeutic category, what can be done? Think of state of the art. Do you ever see a universally superior device or modality across all individual patients and levels of severity and indications and geographies? In this case, that strength of argument, that dialectic becomes more at play. Then at the level of the patient, science may even be out the window. If you've got a, let's say a palliative stent that's clinically and statistically and scientifically significant in prolonging life by a month, and that quality of life is just not acceptable to that patient. Now it's an ethical issue and there's persuasive rhetoric uh, between the patient and the physician in relaying those values. There may be some of that between the auditor, the, the notified body, the evaluator within cross-functional teams. So this is just to encourage us to treat every decision, every conclusion uniquely, and, and just to figure out the sweet spot, the way we blend the, the, these various, uh, the way we triangulate these modes of reasoning. Now we would be remiss if we did not tie this all in with sufficient evidence. This is certainly the topic du jour in the industry right now. I did, I did wanna give a slightly different practice of medicine take on this since it's been so well addressed in other areas. It may surprise you that physicians are not after perfect certitude, perfect closure. How much evidence is enough is how much evidence is required to take an optimizing decision, optimizing benefits over risks. That patient with the sore throat, uh, diagnostic closure would probably warrant a fever, 
uh, tonsillar uh, adenopathy uh, or exudate, uh, swollen lymph nodes, a confirmatory test, and so forth. But if that same patient was part of a family or attended a school where strep pharyngitis was frequent or actually actively there was an outbreak, then a bare minimum of symptoms and potentially not even a confirmatory test would warrant antibiotics. So it's very much case-based and risk-based and dynamic. Negative entropy means uh, disorder in our understanding. So if our understanding is based on say a small case series, the odds that our understanding would be swayed by an RCT published the next day is likely. That swing in our understanding, the more data we add in quality and quantity, eventually there's gonna be less disorder in our understanding we will hit that steady state. The other concept is angle of repose. Picture a granular substance like sand that you're piling on a horizontal plane. At some point, the pile is going to slide over. It does not mean you're out of all the sand that you can find, right? It just means that adding more sand is impossible or insufficient. It's the same holds true with evidence, finding that, that, that area. Uh, and you may even be introducing additional risk by gathering new, new evidence. Certainly conditions for a scientific decision must be met. And ultimately we're headed toward an asymptote, right? We're, we're not reaching scientific law, scientific truth. We're trying to get close, very close to that truth so that we can bridge theoretically to that truth by deploying logical instruments. When the data are in, the narrative serves that purpose. It bridges the data into the objectives of the CER. And this is just represented graphically by that chart, we're adding data to in, increase certitude, decrease disorder, and ultimately bridge to the conclusions through those logical instruments. We've arrived at our destination. We don't have time to take another lap. I think this is available for download. We've grafted the process steps of clinical evaluation over this process flow here for judgment. The takeaway really is the general picture I'm trying to invoke is that the task of the physician and the task of the clinical evaluator are very similar and that we're rendering uh, judgment based on data to reach conclusions. It's an identifiable, analyzable set of problem solving skills uh, where we implement and augment with logic to mitigate uncertainty, but there's, there's very much a, a, an art to it in the sense that there's a practice requirement. We can instruct, on, on regulatory science and logic, but we have to absorb that instruction through practice. And if we're intentional about this, I do think that you will see a positive impact on the quality of your decision-making. Well, I'd like to give Hippocrates the final word here. He was a proponent of sharpening uh, the skills of clinical judgment. He understood the frailties of clinical judgment. And I, I do think that he would empathize with those of us, all of us, uh, that, that, that work with clinical uh, judgment uh, to make our decisions. So he, he said that life is short, art long, opportunity fleeting, experiment treacherous, and judgment very easy. Now he said difficult and also posited that the road to truth, toward truth, passes through judgment. So it is a necessity as well. And lastly, uh, if you'd like to know what not to do, this is our, our reviewer here uh, stating, you know, great CER, but let's cut your carefully reasoned conclusions and just insert that coveted boilerplate template verbiage that we're so fond of. And that is the anatomy of clinical judgment for the process of clinical evaluation. I do hope it's been instructive and, and beneficial to you. And I hope it's left us with some time for a question or two as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert, for the excellent presentation and not just for bringing up the importance of clinical data, but also actually the context of it and the medical importance of, of all the numbers that, that we get out of a clinical trial. Um, before we go into questions, I would quickly, quickly want to remind all the participants that they can still download the slides while we are live. Otherwise, you will be able to download them end of the week. Um, so we got some questions from the participants. Um, Robert, could you suggest a few potential areas of research that might help us gain a more empirical understanding of what good clinical judgment looks like? during the process of clinical evaluation? 
That is a fantastic question. Uh, we, we definitely need more empirical evidence in this area. Uh, and, and I think for me, what would be interesting, I could answer that in a few different ways. The first way I would say, I, I always appreciate the psychological components. If we could bring some of those under closer evaluation with regard to, to the reasoning, uh, the modes of reasoning that we discussed, but, but really what I think is the most important uh, is the, the patterns, the, the way that we are making judgments uh, and the, the outcomes of those judgments. So if, if we had a cross section perhaps of, of clinical evaluators uh, and, and we looked at the way they were making the judgments and we could better determine which judgments are critical, which types of decisions are, are more incidental, which are detrimental and so to speak and tie those into outcomes, that would be fantastic so, so that we could learn a little more about uh, optimizing the way that we think and answer and answer these questions. Uh, I also think there's some areas that are a little more closed off to research, like what, what is happening at the moment uh, when the data aggregate themselves into the right cluster of acceptance criteria. Uh, what's happening the moment that we decide the data are sufficient in quality and quantity? Uh, those would all be intellectually interesting uh, for me to know. So if uh, if we could get that in a report and on my desk by the morning, I would certainly appreciate that. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, unfortunately, we ran out, out of time already. Um, I would like to, to um, the participant to motivate them to ask you the questions directly, if there are any more questions left and to contact you uh, outside of the lecture. So um, thanks again for the excellent summary and uh, we'll see you soon with the next lectures.